Manhattan. Welcome to our Lunch and Learn series, a series that we are as an ongoing series with the Holbing Institute. In this session, Megan McDonough, co-founder of the Holbing Institute, will talk with positive psychology, psychologist Mar Margarita Tarragona about the power of personal narrative. Who we see ourselves to be depends on the story we tell ourselves about who we are. If you change your story, you can change your experience. The stories we tell ourselves about ourselves are especially important in the midst of fear and anxiety. In this session, you'll learn from one of the leaders in the field of narrative therapy about why story matters and how to shape your story towards a better future. Margarita Tarragona, a psychologist who specializes in applying positive psychology, received her PhD from the University of Chicago and obtained her clinical training at the Family Institute of Northwestern University and the Ackerman Institute for Family. The president of the Mexican Positive Psychology Society and a lecturer for the University of Pennsylvania and the ITAM um, and the University of Iberoamericana. Did I say that right? In Mexico City. Welcome to the call, Margarita. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the invitation. As, as I was saying before we officially started, I feel very honored. I've attended several of the webinars and feel very grateful and honored to be here. Oh, thank you, Margarita. Thank you, Caroline. Let us begin as we always begin with a meditation just to really uh, allow ourselves to arrive in this moment. So sitting in whatever way works for you, eyes open, eyes shut, doesn't matter, but do allow yourself a nice deep breath in. And a big exhale. And can that exhale be a true letting go? So the breath falls out as you fall in to this moment. So really letting go with the breath and finding a rootedness and a groundedness in your body. Another deep breath in. Let the breath fall out. And as that breath falls out, coming into this moment and noticing what's true for you. As you pay attention to the length of both legs, the volume of both legs, the weight of the legs. Being aware of the whole length of your spine, right from the very tip of the tailbone up to the top of the head. And see if you're both grounding down and lifting up. Inviting some space between the shoulders and the ears. How much of the backpack of weight that you're carrying can be shed in this moment? Being aware of the sleeves of both arms all the way down to your fingertips. And then aware of the gentle flow of breath coming in and out. I'm thinking of a word or a phrase that you would like to paint the inside of your experience with. And with each breath, imagining that felt sense, that intention, filling the volume of your body. One more deep breath in, big exhale. Softly opening your eyes if they aren't open already. And take a moment and just look at the people that are on this call with you. Look them in the eye and don't worry, it's not creepy. No one can even tell if you're looking at that. And just send a little heartfelt well wishes to each. I'm going to scroll through all, all of the pages so I get a chance. Oh, I see some faces I know. I know, I know. So scroll through, get a sense of who's sharing this space with you. Oh, 
Welcome. Really good to see you all. Hi, happy Monday. Monday, I guess, is Megan Day, MM. Uh, and during this time, I get the profound pleasure of having really interesting conversations with really interesting people. And today, I have the good fortune of chatting with Margarita. Margarita is not only all of those things that Caroline said, she's also a dear friend and colleague who I've had the amazing experience of teaching alongside with uh, in the certificate in holding positive uh, psychology that we ran in Mexico. Uh, her and I taught together in that course. So I learned a lot from her. She, just so that you know, because she's very humble and she's very understated and very easily connected to that the breadth and width of her wisdom is profound. Uh, she is one of the leaders in positive psychology, although you'll never hear her say that. She is one of the people that is in the forefront of how we think about personal stories and how we apply those stories um, and shape them constructively for oneself. So you are in the presence of who someone I think of as a very wise woman. Oh, I hope that didn't embarrass you, so you too much, much Mike. <laughs> you do, <laughs> you do, but thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Oh, so welcome, my friend. It's good to be here with you. Wonderful I, to be here. I actually want to start with a very simple question. Like sometimes when we do these write-ups and we, and we say, let's talk about the personal narrative. Sure. To you and me, that might mean something, but other people might say, well, what the heck does that mean, our personal story? So can we start with sort of a framework of what we talk, what we mean when we say narrative? Right. Um, well, a narrative is basically a series of events, occurrences, phenomena that are connected over time. So they, for us, they feel, they make sense in a cohesive or co coherent way. So our personal narratives are the way in which we connect our experiences. So they make sense to us. They feel like a story. We don't have just one personal narrative. We have many uh, that coexist, just like a good novel or a good uh, movie may have several subplots, uh, you know, intertwined with one another. So basically, I guess the most important, for me, the most important aspects of narratives is that they are not just one event. They are a number of, of events or experiences that they are connected and that it, they happen over time. It has a, a, a history, you know, it starts in the past, there's a present, and it usually includes something that we're thinking about the future. It's interesting when we think of the story, uh, conceptually, I get what you're saying about connected mm -hmm. in time, uh -huh. but I, I think what's hard to recognize is how embedded and invisible our personal narratives can be. That's true. In everyday life. So. Mm -hmm. Maybe give us an example of how a personal narrative shapes how we see the day and the decisions that we make. Right. Well, um, if I may take a little detour, there are some authors like Dan McAdams from Northwestern University who specializes in studying narr uh, personal narratives. And he says that actually our self, our sense of self is a narrative mm. about, about um, each of us. So you're right that it's not always evident, but it does shape the way we understand ourselves, the way we see ourselves, the way we interact with others. So for example, to, to make like a little, uh, like a caricature, somebody who says, well, I'm not really smart. I'm very awkward. I, I make a lot of mistakes. I am not very good at anything. That's, uh, you know, if you repeat it enough, it becomes a way of seeing yourself. So how, how do you behave then? How do you present yourself at work or with other people? And that in turn, you know, uh, elicits a reaction from them. So um, the way you think about yourself obviously impacts the way you interact with others and that in turn interacts with your way of defining yourself. So is the story, like, I, I noticed, I'm going to give you a personal experience from sure. my own life. Can I do that? I, this yeah. isn't my therapy session. Mark, no, no. <laughs> uh -huh. One of the things I've been thinking a lot about, um, you know, the world is crazy, uh, you know, different and 
uncertain and changing with COVID and now a lot of the riots right. and what we're seeing in the world. And I've been wanting, I've been finding myself wanting to give more, um, mm. you know, so the, the, the personal story I hear coming up is, oh my gosh, if I tried to do that particular thing, it would take too much work. I wouldn't be able to do it. It would, mm -hmm. it would exhaust me. I can't do that. So mm. the, I, I recognize as it's coming up, that that's part of my story. If I right. were to do something that there'd be another piece to that, that I wouldn't be able to handle it. Right. Is that, is that a personal, is that part of the personal narrative? I think so. And it? Uh, yeah, and one thing that could be done, even of course, this is not a therapy session and narrative <laughs> work, by the way, is not just for therapy, it can be used in coaching and education. But if, but if you want to, to give something, uh, you know, uh, you could have a conversation about what motivates you to give, what value is that desired linked to, you know, the desire to contribute. And then also, and then maybe look at examples. You, I even smiled when I heard you that you said that would be too much because I know you and I know that you take on big projects. So maybe so a conversation that could take place would be about, have you had experiences in which you've taken on things that require a lot of effort and how did you do that? What was it like? So uh, you would find evidence of, uh, of stories in which you have been very capable of taking on big, meaningful projects. Mm. And I'm curious, as you guys listen to this, what is your personal story that you're telling yourself? Uh, so let's give some examples. Let's enliven one another with how, what are the stories we're telling ourselves? They, and they don't always have to be like heroic. They could be, the story I'm telling myself is I can't go outside my house. Or the story I'm telling myself is I can do something. What are the stories that you're sell, telling yourself about uh, how the world is unfolding? So the first thing I hear, I'm sorry, Margarita, were you going to say No, something? I just wanted to mention something we, we briefly mentioned before we started about the context of, of, of everything that's going on. I have to admit I felt that uh, today's topic or what could be my contribution feels so tiny in the, in the midst of the huge social issue, issues that are going on. And what I was going to mention is that personal narratives do not, uh, occur in a vacuum. They are, of course, in the in the context of the culture that we're a part of, the family that we're a part of. So, the, the our stories are personal, but they are part of. They are constructed within the possibilities that our context allows us. Mm, yeah. So the first thing you're saying is like being aware of our personal narratives, understanding there's a social fabric, and mm -hmm. then there are some ways in to shape that personal narrative uh, in ways that are perhaps more helpful. Uh, so before we get to there, let me just see what's coming in from, okay. um, so like, for example, one story is like, how do I figure out how to be an activist at this time? Mm -hmm. I think that's a story okay. a lot of people are talking, what do I do? Here is all this right. stuff happening. Who mm -hmm. am I in the face of this, basically? Right, right. Uh -huh. And uh, another came in that's scared that the country will not heal. So perception of the future, the stories we're telling ourselves about what could be and what could happen. Uh, thank you, Elaine and Ellen. So we have these stories and then what do we do with them? How do we think about uh, not only being aware of them, but using them to shape who we could become or how we could see what's happening? You mentioned two. Um, Let's just reiterate that list for example, of what we could do. For example, wanting to figure out how to be an activist at this time, or? Just in general, like we don't have oh, to take sorry. that one specific oh, thing. Okay, like the tools sorry. of uh, narrative, and you already mentioned a couple of them. Like yeah. one of, what are the ways I have done this in the past that I could pull mm -hmm. forward here? Mm -hmm. uh, but what are some other ways that we could look at our, either become aware of our narrative or use tools to reshape our narrative? Yeah. Well, I think it's useful to, um, to make it more specific because at least for me it can be paralyzing like if somebody tells you well tell me your story it's too big like tell me about yeah. yourself it's too big but tell me about you as a mother or tell me about you as a, a doctor or as an activist or tell me about your experiences with hope or tell me about your experiences about in you know in couples relationships so, so if we narrate a little bit it's easier for us to to draw of to, to you know elicit our experience um mm. 
but then I'm sorry, but I forgot what the question was. So an interesting thing, at least something that I find helpful that is often done in narrative practices is to separate um, the person from the, if, if we're talking about an obstacle, uh, from the obstacle, or it could also be about something positive. For example, uh, somebody mentioned hope. I find that it's very generative to ask somebody about their relationship with hope. Instead of just telling me about hope, if you think about hope as a presence or as a character or as something in your life that you relate to, you can think about, well, how, what kind of relationship do I have with hope? Do, like, do I like to have it around but keep it at bay? I don't like it to be too close. I hold on to it for dear life. What helps me nurture it? So that's in the case of hope, that's something beautiful. But, but oftentimes when something is an obstacle, it's even more helpful. Like for example, if somebody's talking about, um, I don't know, feeling uh, paralyzed. So tell me about paralysis. What is paralysis doing to you right now? Uh, how does paralysis work in your life? What keeps paralysis strong? What, weak, what can make paralysis smaller? So I know it sounds a little strange or artificial, but it really has an impact because it puts some distance between the person and whatever is getting in the way of their being the way they would prefer to be. And this brings us to another concept that I really like in, in narrative work, which is the idea of a preferred self, that we have some choice in terms of how we want to be. Our dear friend, uh, Maria Sira often uses the phrase, how do you want to show up? I love that idea of how do you want to show up? How do I want to be in these circumstances? Of course, our options are not infinite. You know, if I decided I want to be like a world-class gymnast, well, I can't, but how do I want to be in this situation? Do I want to be more involved? Do I want to be uh, more brave? Do I want to be more cautious? How do I want to, what's my preferred self in the current in the moment that I'm living or in the circumstances that I'm facing. So those are great. Both of those, uh, the preferred self concept, we've talked a lot about the different selves and the choices in previous webinars. And I love this one about the using as a noun uh, or the, uh, using the, um, the thing or the obstacle as a separate self. Right. That is such an interesting <laughs> mental construct to do. It's like a And you were brain absolutely teaser. right in saying it as a noun because an exercise we sometimes do in workshops is if somebody uses an adjective that is restricting them too much, that is getting in the way of how they would prefer to be. For example, if somebody says, I am shy, I am anxious, I am disorganized. The, the exercise is to identify that adjective, shy, disorganized, but anxious and turn it into a, a noun. Shyness, disorganization, anxiety. And then you can think about it differently. How can you interact or relate to that anxiety or, or disorganization or whatever? So you- So for, let's take a real up. life example of, of from mm -hmm. what Lauren wrote in uh, as part of her, her story of imposter syndrome. Like oh. imposter, I think of like, I, I that's not me, I'm, I, I'm doing something. So, Use that, use that tool using the word imposter. How would, how would one go about doing that? Okay, the syndrome, okay. She already put it as a, as an, uh, as a noun, like not that I'm an imposter, but I deal with or suffer from imposter syndrome. So there's a lot you could do about it, depending, playfully you could say, well, imagine this imposter syndrome uh, was a character in your life, uh, what would it be like? Would it be a cartoon? Would it be a scary monster? Is it big? Is it little? What is it like? Would you like to give a name to that imposter syndrome? Maybe you'll, maybe you'll just call it syndrome or maybe they'll call it Harry or something. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, when, did it, when did imposter syndrome enter your life? Uh, did it arrive with a bang or did it slowly seep into your life? How can you tell when it's there? Uh, can other people see it? Uh, and what uh, what would be the the arch enemy or the what do you call when what's the what's the word the antidote for imposter syndrome? Maybe it's I don't know self confidence. You know the person has to come up with it. But the idea is to to 
either gain some distance, in some cases put it in its place, to, and also very, uh, it's useful to make an account of what are the occasions in which the imposter syndrome has not gotten away with mm. its objectives. When have you been able to do things well, successfully, beautifully, despite the imposter syndrome? So those are just some ideas. I feel I'm talking too quickly. I'm sorry. I am actually loving what you're saying because my mind is just popcorning out. First of all, I like the name Harry for the imposter syndrome. <laughs> it, it, when you name something like that, it does sort of lighten the load of saying, like I automatically started thinking, I would uh, say, I call the imposter syndrome uh, Harry, and I would call self-confident Sally. And oh, Harry, Beth, and Sally. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're trying to do, and I hear you doing these fun things, is it's sort of lightening the load. You're mentally still addressing it, because a lot of times some of what people have been telling us uh, is that it feels lighthearted what we're doing, mm -hmm. um, and maybe this, it doesn't meet the seriousness of what we're feeling. How do we actually hold the whole? Mm -hmm. And I hear using this concept, it feels both lighthearted and serious. Like you're seeing imposter syndrome and you're trying to find out more about it. You're trying to explore it. You're not trying to deny it exactly. and make it something else. So uh, talk a little bit about uh, narrative as being able to see more clearly uh, that which we've been maybe perhaps wanting to avoid or push away or overcome versus like holding the whole. Yeah, I think one of the, the keys of any good um, relational practice, whether it's coaching, whether it's therapy, is this difficult balance of holding with all seriousness what's painful, what's difficult, and at the same time, what, what is, what's right, what's going well, what's luminous. So maybe this example, I did it a little playfully, but uh, when you're with, when somebody's going through a lot of pain, it is also useful to find those little glimpses or those little slivers, as Dan Tomasulo says about hope, for example. So somebody, if somebody has experienced a lot of inadequacy or a lot of hopelessness, it's imp important, A, mo more than anything, to listen and to really be present and listen with care and, and respect to what the person is experiencing. And then careful, after the main issue has been identified, for example, hopelessness, then ask questions about times when he or she may have seen a little bit, may have experienced a little bit of hope or seen a, you know, a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel. And then when those are identified, to with curiosity, ask more and more questions to, to expand them so they can be part of the story too. They cannot disappear or deny the other aspect, but to help them gain force and be there so the person can have a fuller uh, view of themselves or their possibilities. And I think when you think about narratives, I mean, if you were to read a book that was all dark and didn't have any glimmer of hope, you, yeah, you would put that. it down, you you would, would, <laughs> of course. And it, if it's it, too light, then yeah, you... It doesn't engage you. So uh, I think when I, when I look at something as uh, like imposter syndrome and, and, and knowing that it's there and calling it Harry and making it really weaving into the narrative some, uh, just making the ingredients of a good story for yourself, one that you can recognize and live into, um, and also grow from Sounds right healing right and, and as many, growth as opportunities hear, right as i hear you i see what looks like a tapestry behind you is it like yes. a woven thing yes. Uh, yes and it reminds me of a metaphor that is often used in narrative work uh, that's borrowed from anthropology and it talks about thin descriptions versus thick descriptions a thin description is a story about a person or a group of people that is just based on, on one or two features or ideas um, and it, it's not very rich, whereas a thick description weaves many aspects of a, of a person, of a group, of a culture, of a, and it's much richer and sturdier, of course. So that's a metaphor that is often used in relation to narrative work. How can we make our stories more multifaceted, uh, uh, thicker tapestries? 
Yeah, and sometimes when we look at those ones that feel thin, that have been with us our entire life, that we can't get over or haven't yet got get built that sort of bigger picture, it can feel really exhausting. Oh, there's the imposter syndrome again. Oh, there's this <laughs> thing again. And and I guess I should shout out, this is Phoebe Atkinson's sister who made me this. Oh, wow. It's actually a quilt of oh. uh, the, the whole being institute. Oh, spine. I love it. I and I'm seeing a lot of, I want to just check chat because I'm way okay, behind because yes. I'm yes. so engaged in chatting with you. Uh, some things that some people have said. Uh, so we talked about imposter. Um, some of the parents at my son's school went to protest with masks on. I feel like going out to protest, but it's not safe. Uh, mm -hmm. and still recovering from COVID. Uh, oh. So what then? So I think what, what, has, what Elisa has pointed out is when the story has a lot of conflicting options, right? Of like course. I want to go out and, and, and be part of the protest, but I'm afraid of COVID. I'm, a, I'm a, uh, also a, a solo parent. These are all different selves or narratives that are, right. may not be playing together. How do you integrate right. all of that? Well, I think that, um, you know, the, the idea of personal narratives is one part of life, but there are other, of course, realities like the huge social and uh, physical, biological realities we're facing. So, for example, in this case, for example, if somebody's recovering from COVID, well, I think that's, of course, the, the priority. You know? um, so I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't follow the rest of the, of the question. Megan, could it wasn't so much a question, question as, it was, no. as it was just a, uh, an acknowledgement of the story of what Elisa yeah. is saying, that there's many mm -hmm. different threads and, mm -hmm. and there's no one right answer, you know, in this. Mm -hmm. There is uh, a richness to the tapestry. Oh, somebody uh, asked. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. So a clarification question. Somebody said, am I the only one who doesn't know what imposter syndrome is? Oh. <laughs> it's, it's what we feel when we when we think, for example, you know, if you get a good review from your boss, you think, ah, oh, but he doesn't really know me yet. If he really knew me, maybe he wouldn't have such a good impression of me. Or, oh, should I go ahead with this, you know, proposal or this project? I don't know. I don't, uh, people think I'm capable of it, but I really don't think I'm very capable of doing it. So that's why it's called imposter syndrome. Okay. Here's an interesting one about, there are many ways to be an activist and protesting is just one. Take your skills, what you can contribute to this moment and most likely to a more positive future. I love that. I think that's a, a really beautiful way to put it. And Janet asked a great question that was actually one of the questions on my list too, that as okay. we write about our personal narratives, are there writing prompts that would be helpful? Hmm. I think, um, they're depending on the purpose of what you want to write about. Um, in general, I think it's useful uh, for me to, to inquire, to explore areas that we know have to do with well-being. So for example, uh, we know that people who live in a way that's coherent with their values have fuller, more satisfying lives. So what are the most important values for me? What actions have I taken that are aligned with those values? Is there something that I would like to do? And how does that, uh, how is that related to my most important values? Relationships, we know that relationships are probably the most important factor for happiness and well-being. So what are the, the most important relationships in my life right now? What are the relationships that sustain me? How can I nurture these relationships? Who can I count on to take on this bold, action that I want to take. Uh, meaning, we, you've had Michael Steger here in, uh, in the webinars, and if we, if we are curious about what gives most meaning to my life at this moment, what have been the sources of meaning in the past, uh, how can I be in touch with people who share the same uh, sources of meaning that nurture me? Uh, goals, we also know that people who set goals and pursue them tend to have fuller lives. So what are my three most important goals for the rest of this year? What are the steps that I can take? What from my previous experience can give me confidence to move towards reaching these goals? So these are some, I think the idea is to take a concept or a phenomenon and see how it is connected to our experiences over time. Can you tell us a little bit more about whatever started the field of personal narratives, what, what's the genesis for looking at who we are through the lens of our own story? 
Um, within psychology, it was started by the work of Jerome Bruner, who was a cognitive psychologist from, uh, from New York, actually, I think. He died a couple of years ago. He was over 100 years old. He was a cognitive psychologist. And at the time when there was a big boom in cognitive psychology that compared our minds to computers and saw all the interesting knowledge we can derive from that, how in many ways our minds are like computers in the way we process some information, he uh, started to think about the limitations of that analogy and how there's some things that computers couldn't do, I don't know if they can do it now, which is to narrate, to create stories and to find, and to find meaning. So he started a movement called narrative psychology that, that focused on how we construct stories and how through story we ascribe meaning to our experiences. So that's how it, it, was, it was born in the world of psychology. And in the world of psychotherapy, it was started by an Australian social worker, Michael White, and a Canadian born anthropologist, David Epstein, but who had moved to New Zealand. And they were very critical of the uh, most dominant ideas in psychotherapy that tended to um, pathologize people and criticize, and not criticize, that was my Freudian slip, and to pathologize, <laughs> to pathologize people. And uh, they tie this in with the idea of narratives, how uh, when people come in to ask, uh, when they're suffering, sometimes their suffering can be understood as being constricted by a narrative that is too limiting, too overwhelming or simple, like he's a bad kid, or we have a terrible marriage, or I am depressive. So they thought that those narratives could be expanded. And they also questioned the, the professional narrative of pathology. That's why they started to separate the person from the problems, how they would talk about somebody dealing with depression instead of thinking this is a depressed patient. So um, in my opinion, that's the genesis. On the one hand, from the research in cognitive psychology that highlighted the importance of, of the stories and meaning making, and on the other hand, from a critical movement within the field of psychotherapy that saw the, they would never say the cure, but saw therapeutic work as a labor of expanding person's stories to give place to their preferred selves. And I'm curious, I almost think that there's two stories, at least, one of which is a story of who we see ourselves to be, and another story of that which we want to become, sort of an aspirational story of self. How is it that people can first determine the stories that are telling themselves? Like, is this a writing exercise is it interesting how do we how do we actually discover our story i think we're doing it all the time all the time uh, when you introduce yourself to somebody at a, at a meeting or when you're talking with your best friend and talking about your relationship with your daughter from an other angle even though you've talked it about many times we're constantly it's not like a work that is like a thesis that's finished and then it's done we're like we're constantly rewriting our stories metaphorically speaking um, at the same time there are writing exercises literally writing uh, that can help us uh, um, strengthening or, or change our stories. You, I know you know, Megan, the work of James Pennebaker, who has researched the usefulness of writing about traumatic experiences, for example. And he has seen that when people write their deepest thoughts and feelings, that's the instruction about a traumatic experience, after doing it for a few days, for about 10 minutes a day, they actually improve and they have less symptoms of depression, for example, and they even have better health. And then there's people like Laura King who have studied the effects of writing about the future, about writing about your best possible self and seeing that when people write about a moment in the future in which in where things have gone right, when life has unfolded as they would have liked it to unfold, when they feel they have reached their goals, when they write about that, they experience a lot more positive emotion and other indicators of well-being. So it's both. In a way, we don't have to worry much about it because we do it every day verbally when we talk. Um, though it's good to be aware because I said we shouldn't worry. But yeah, if you're constantly saying something about yourself that doesn't yeah, go with right. it, 
how you prefer to be, then you should be aware. But what I meant is that we do it kind of informally through conversation, more formally through professional conversations with a coach or therapist or counselor, and also um, in using the written word, uh, word either by journaling or by doing some of these interventions that are based on writing. Yeah, and I loved when you taught the course on personal narratives at Whole Being Institute, uh, you, you did talk about making it into a noun, which I thought was very helpful, but in, in what would the icon be or the superhero be? Uh, you had people play, you did these fun exercises on that. And then you had something about an icon uh, or an award that you would give people. Do you oh, remember that? I know. Oh, I know what you mean. Towards the end, sometimes yeah. in, in narrative therapy, and it can also be done in coaching, towards the end, people get a diploma or a certificate. This was started when Epstein and White worked with children. And for example, um, they often worked with children who had fears. So they created the Australian Association of Fear Busters and Monster Tamers. So uh, towards the end of their work with a child who used to be fearful and now was not as fearful, they had this diploma. Of course, I mean, it's playful. You know, the, the Australian Association of Fear, uh, or Fear, what did I say? Tamers and Monster, you know, whatever, gives this award to Johnny Smith in recognition that Johnny has been able to tame his fears and he's able to give good advice to other children who may be afraid of monsters. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's funny, it's funny and playful, but uh, it's also used with adults. I remember once we were working uh, as a team of, of therapists because it was in the context of a, of a class with a, with a woman who had many, who was suffering from depression and other difficulties. And towards the, and we worked for eight sessions. And in the end, at the eighth session, we did write a diploma in which each of the therapists that had witnessed the process wrote down something that they saw, something positive that they appreciated about, uh, about her. So somebody said like she was like the phoenix bird who had arisen from her ashes because she had experienced tremendous trauma. Somebody talked about her intelligence and they wrote that in the diploma. And several months afterwards, uh, another colleague was doing a research project about people's experiences in therapy and she was one of the participants in the research and she said you know what once in a while I take out my diploma which is in my drawer and read it again and the researcher said well and why do you do that and she says because it reminds me of who I am mm -hmm. so these documents can be testimonies to the way people the, the best in what people can be. Yeah, so it reminds me of the, uh, what we do with the Certificate in Positive Psychology with the reflected best self. Yes, that you was a ask, Yeah, well, you ask other people, uh, and it's sort of awkward, we never ask other people. Yes, it is. So it would have to be trusted people that we admire, you know, a spouse, a significant other. Uh, what do you see in me? Um, and, the stories that are reflected back are like these gemstones and touchstones yeah. yes. of the truth of people's story that they forget mm -hmm. about. Because not only do we gloss over or heighten uh, sort of the difficult challenges in our story, yes. uh, we miss sort of the gemstones of what's helpful, what strengths we bring to bear. Um, I love that. I know we have more comments, but before I forget, I love this what you said about gemstones, because it reminds me of another metaphor that is often used or image that's used about narrative work. They say that it's like panning for gold. You know, those images of the, you know, the gold rush where people would have these sifters and they would sift through all the pebbles and rocks in the water of the river, looking for little nuggets of gold. That's kind of like the work that, that we do. Those nuggets are, of gold are the exceptions to problems or the best features of of people who that sometimes are not appreciated or seen with clarity. Mm, thanks, Margarita. And Elisa asked a question about, would you write down what's said about talking about trauma? That was James Pennybaker. Yes, I know uh, write it down. Yeah, and uh, uh, also Laura King talked about the, the writing exercise for the best possible future self. Right. And, and didn't Jan 
Wasn't Laura King James Penny Baker's student? Is that, did they have a connection? She was, yeah, right, yeah. you're right, yeah. yeah. She started with him studying the effects of writing on trauma and then expanded it to explore the effects of writing on well-being. Yeah, great. She, she, has also, she has also studied the effects about writing about peak experiences in one's life. Uh, many people report the birth of a child or a graduation or an important professional accomplishment as a peak experience. And writing about that can also be helpful. And, and Linda asked a question, which I think, I think we answered, but I'm going to circle back to Linda to make sure we addressed it. In other words, do we need to write it all down when we're understanding no. our narratives? And it's so no. multi-layered. How do we weave it all together? Yeah. We, I don't think you can, I think there's ways you can, for example, keep a journal that's very useful. You can maybe attend a workshop, but I don't think we need to write it down. I think it actually happens more, um, you know, you're in everyday conversation. It reminds me of the, the um, image of natural movement versus going to the gym. You know, you go to the gym to strengthen certain muscles with specific exercises. But if you move naturally throughout your day, that's also really good for your health. So I think that if we are, if we try to bring out the best in other people in our conversations with them, that's like the, a natural um, strengthening of positive personal stories. Mm. I'm even curious, like, I, it, it's, I started thinking as you were saying this natural living out of the story like I'm thinking to myself how do I look at myself in these webinars like what is the story I'm telling myself about uh how we share how Caroline and I share this work during COVID um and it didn't really it actually didn't dawn on me now I'm telling myself a story uh that I didn't recognize it's time for me to step up or there's more that we have to give uh, oh, I can uh -huh. actually I can actually hear the negative like if I wanted to do more, I don't know how I would fit it in. That's sort of the, the, the shadow side of the story, but this, mm -hmm. the story had already started with this work. And so the more I think about stories as being an organic, natural way in which we grow this sense of self. Exactly. Oh, I think you put it beautifully, beautifully. I'm not gonna sit with that for a bit because oh, it's okay. like, uh -huh. <laughs> okay. I don't know. That's like, uh -huh. I, I actually tend to con concentrate a lot. And we teach this in, in in SIP is the certificate of course is the different selves. Like we have our authentic self, we mm. have an aspirational self, we have mm. our art self. But you're saying all of those selves are just different narratives or stories we have using different perspectives. I think that's one way, one way to put it. I think like any analogy, there's limitations to it. And, and of course, the idea of the self as a story is an analogy. Um, but I think, yeah, that it also helps us account for the, um, what would be the word? Like our identity, even though the word identity from the Latin means one or, or unified, our identity is not so unified. We do have... Uh, you were using the word gem, like we have different facets and we have different aspects of ourselves that are not always uh, completely congruent. So I think that the, the story analogy, if we think of our life as a novel, allows us to think of different plots or different, it, it doesn't have to be one, one super unified, totally coherent self. Mm -hmm. Like like Walt Whitman said in his famous poem, we contain multitudes, right? <laughs> I love his whole quote. You know, do I contradict myself? Well, then I contradict myself. <laughs> I am large, I contain multitudes. I love that. I use that all the time when someone says, oh, but you said it differently before. Well, I changed. It doesn't uh, work with one kids, though. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's right. Uh, so I wonder if you could give us an example. I would love to hear... Uh, Maybe this is me wanting to be aspirational because sometimes I, I think we fix in our mind's eye that this is the story I'm living is a story I've lived with for my entire life. I can't possibly move from this tragic, from this tragic saga to a comedy. Mm -hmm. um, have, mm -hmm. Do you have any examples of anyone that you've worked with that you've seen uh, weave a whole new story as they begin to understand uh, mm -hmm. The, the narrative that they were writing for themselves. Mm. Can you give us some examples of that? Yes. At the, at the same time, I think most of the times, at least in my experience, 
changes are not like super dramatic. They tend to be more subtle, but meaningful, I think. Um, so, for example, I was, there's, there's so many that, that it's hard to choose, but I was thinking of a person I was working with who came to see me because she felt she was a mediocre professional. And she was kind of, she had surprised herself by this realization because she had always been a very good student. She did really well. But after several years of working in a field, she felt she was mediocre. So this was a very clear, like dominant story, like I'm mediocre. And uh, we talked about why, why did she feel that way? And she didn't really, she felt she hadn't accomplished much. And kind of in conversation, we were exploring her, her professional work and what she was doing. And then she mentioned that on the side, she was very involved with a community organization. And that she had realized a few weeks ago that the director of the, of the community organization couldn't attend because of some reason, she had kind of taken on the leadership kind of spontaneously and changed some of the procedures and they were a lot more productive that week. So she started to see how she did really well in that, uh, doing something different that was not what she had chosen as her profession. And she decided to explore that more and more and realized that that's what she was really good at. And actually within a few months changed from what she had done for years to becoming very, very active and ended up, uh, you know, formally leading an, um, an NGO. So that's uh, one example. So instead, and there, it's like the, the story of mediocrity was still there, but what started to emerge was a story of competence, of leadership, of a deep passion to help other people, especially uh, the group of people that this uh, NGO was serving. So it's like the, the mediocre story was still there, but kind of weak and compared to this growing identity of her as a community leader and, and leader of an NGO. Wow, what a great story. Thank you, Margarita. Um, so Caroline had asked, maybe we can go back to this. I'm sorry, I miss this, Caroline. Uh, uh, we were talking about the stories that we tell ourselves and we might forget the good so easily. Uh, exactly. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, she's wondering if it's the brain's negativity bias. Absolutely. Or... It is the negativity bias. Uh, you know that Rick Hanson in the field of positive psychology famously has said that our brain has Velcro for the negative and Teflon for the positive. So I think that actually storying is one way to develop Velcro for the positive. So let's say, you know, if your kid comes home and he says, mom, I got an A in my biology exam. Maybe you just say, oh, that's nice, Billy. Okay, well, it, it kind of, you know, sl slips uh, by. But if you, so tell me more, uh, Billy, how come, tell me how you, how you got your A this time. Did you study differently? How did the teacher tell you? Was this a topic that you were interested in? So then as if you inquire, if you have curiosity about it, then just the, the grade turns into a little story about a success in his biology class and he's more likely to remember it. Mm. And maybe he will then, you know, hopefully then he will also study hard for his next biology class. I wish I had known all this when my kids were younger. It's what I keep uh, right. <laughs> me too, me too. One thing is theory. I, I, was right along. I did everything wrong. <laughs> oh, come on. See, that's a dominant story in itself. Oh, that is a dominant story. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Yeah. Have you seen that yeah. video that, that has circulated well, a, a few, I guess, last year? on social media where they interview mothers about how they are as mothers. And a lot of them talk about how guilty they feel, how they don't do things right, how they don't pay enough attention to their kids. And then they bring in their children for four oh. or five, one by one, and they ask them to describe their mothers. And it really you know, makes made me cry, it makes a lot of people cry, to see how the kids saw their mothers and never once mentioned the, the things that their mothers thought were doing. Oh, well. my goodness. I would like to find that. I did I not would see too. That. I don't know the name. I would, love to, I would love to see. I, I do remember the Dove commercials where uh, people were asked to describe themselves. Yes. Uh, and yeah. this is, so I, from a position of storytelling, how often Absolutely. do we tell That's our a story own story? Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. 
Yeah, right. we, we notice everything that's wrong, everything that mm-hmm. every wart on, uh, every freckle, mm-hmm. everything that seems out of place, and right. we miss the beauty within, exactly. which is what I so appreciate about um, your narrative work is that you're always trying to pull out from people uh, the, the, the emerging goodness that's held in the whole to see. Thank um, you. Oh, I really like this comment by Caroline that she's saying is one of the most powerful aspects of narrative seeing ourselves as the author of our story and directing our lines lives versus simply reporting on things absolutely absolutely uh, it's often said that people like to be in the driver's seats of their lives and that's true you know the sense of agency is so important um and, and you're right we I, i'm so glad you mentioned this because i forgot to, to say it earlier on when we're talking and we're, we're uh, telling others about our experiences we're not just reporting data or facts as we do it we're creating stories and influencing our own view of of ourselves so great point thank you caroline Mm. jennifer asked a question what if the story is opposite of the imposter syndrome Mm -hmm. and the child is told they can do anything they think uh they can and Mm -hmm. they go into the world and they start to fail and they fail over and over amid some success how does Mm -hmm. one deal with that Good point. It reminds me of the research by Carol Dweck on fixed mindsets and and growth mindsets. What she found in a nutshell, maybe a lot of you know about this already, is that when children are praised about their innate skill or intelligence, uh, for example, they did an an experiment in which they had to to, do a puzzle. And they, one group was told, you're so good, you're a great, you're great with puzzles, you're so smart. And then another group, they got feedback about the process of what they were doing. Oh, so you're looking for the corners first. Oh, I see that you group them by color. Wow, it's nice to see that you don't give up. And then they asked both groups of children if they wanted to try a harder puzzle. And it turns out the ones that were praised about their smarts were not as likely to want to take on a challenge. Whereas the ones who were given feedback about what they were doing were more eager to take on a challenge. So your question um, reminds me of that. It's hard to know um, what to like, what to say, because it depends a lot on the special, on the circumstances, on the child. But I, my first thoughts have to do with what's the meaning, whether it's really a, a failure. What's the meaning of it? About how sometimes in we always constantly fail in life. What can we learn from that experience? Um, how I think what would be important is how not to let those uh, failures define completely who they are, but how they may, um, what's the word, like balance the, the exaggerated sense of, of extraordinary ability. I am noticing the time, Margarita. And yes. as we come down to the top of the hour and before I hand it back over to Caroline to talk about the rest of the week, is there any uh, parting sentence, not to put too much pressure on the endings, but is there something you would like to leave us with to remind us about the, uh, the positive aspects of using our narratives in a way that is helpful for us? Mm-hmm. I really like how you put it in a way that's help us for us, help us for us, because it, help us for us makes me think about a desire, we want, a longing, a dream or a goal. And I think that especially in these times that are so, so difficult in many ways, how do we want to be, what, what grain of sand do we want to contribute, can we contribute to the difficult world in which we're living? And if we can have access to the best of ourselves, we may be better able to to get closer to what we want to achieve or to what we want to contribute. This, I think right now, the way I see the things, uh, I think contribution is probably more in our minds than achievement. Mm-hmm. I know it is for me too, Margarita, and I'm very, very, very grateful for your contribution to the conversation. Oh, thank you. It's been lovely. And let's let's do let's do a favor to Margarita as we end out today. Write in some of the of the strengths that you saw Margarita showing us and giving us oh. some of the gifts that she gave us. As oh, I turn it you. over to Caroline, and she can give us an update on the rest of the week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margarita. Absolutely! Wow. Well, I just saw. 
love and kindness and also, um, gosh, such articulation of intelligence and um, <laughs> love of learning, right? Oh, and thank you so it much. Was, it was just really, really fun for me to listen to you both. And, and there's a, there was a wonderful just love and compassion and exchange between the two of you that was so enjoyable. I, I wanted to talk about tomorrow. I mean, speaking of tomorrow and love and compassion, we're going to be discussing gratitude. And I'll put it in the chat um, with Yaro, who has written a book, I believe, right? A little, a little mm -hmm. book that she's going to be talking about and some practices. So we'll have some uh, a chance to interact with her. And, and then Wednesday, um, Megan and I are going to join forces. I'm so excited Yay. about that. And we're going to talk about embodied positive psychology and our favorite tips as movers and people that uh, love to use the body uh, and positive psychology. And Thursday, I have to look it up. Megan, do you remember who we have on Thursday? Let me put you on the spot. Let me, I can tell you in just a second. <laughs> uh, we have, I know it's been going so fast. Um, understanding how your why boosts resilience, our Brooklyn success uh, with Laura Garrison Brook. Yes. Yes, and Laura, that should be really interesting. And it was funny because um, those of you that were at the Tacoon last Thursday night at 12.30 in the morning, Alicia was talking, Goldstein was talking about the power of why. So we're going to really get a, a chance to, to look at that. And then finally, we have had someone um, that you may or may not know, Megan. Her name is Jamie Meyer, and she is a heart math person. And we've been talking about coherence, and she's going to just do a workshop uh, for everybody on Thursday night. If anybody wants to do that, that's fifteen and twenty dollars. Really easy to talk about that work, which I I find very very useful and very helpful. Great, lovely. Yeah. As we think about what's going on in our culture and our society, and what that narrative is, and as we go forth in our day today. I just want to thank you both for helping us ground and um, I want to encourage everybody to really take care of yourself and to listen and to know what your next steps will be because there are some actions that we all will be asked to take I'm sure if not now in the next coming days and and um, and we as a JCC will be looking at ways that we can be more active and looking at racial bias and and what we can do so that everyone in our culture feels safe, mm -hmm. right? I mm -hmm. think that's a human right, that mm -hmm. everyone has the right in America to feel safe. Thank so you. thank you for joining us. And um, I don't know if Zoom allows me to unmute everybody. I don't think the new Zoom does that. So let's mm -hmm. all just wave. And Megan, could you mm -hmm. end with our loving kindness meditation? Could you take oh, us Oh, yes, that? of course. So deep breath in. Big exhale. And as you exhale, open up your hands. Look at someone in the eye. And imagine you can send them more wishes as you say to yourself, may you be happy. May you be healthy. May you be safe. May you live with ease. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Margarita, thank you so much. Thank you. Such a pleasure. Thank you. And good luck to everybody. Bye-bye.